And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us straight from the coming to us straight from the land of Mecca and Kaiju. Now coming back with its thir with its third incarnation in the for in the form of twenty two X or <laughs> how, which is the closest way I'm gonna s I'm going to say it. Um, he is he is not he is not Mister Wrong, but he is Jonathan Wright. But sometimes. Well, I my well, I go on to my. Oh God, I said it wrong. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming. Thank you for coming on. Um, so, I suppose I'll start at the humble beginnings, as I often do, since that's one of the traditions, along with the drinking. Oh, summit by summit. By the way, I only I only drink local. I'm sure through, they appreciate it. Yeah, walk me through your intro, your introduction to role playing games, and what made it stick. Oh, wow. That goes back a long ways. Um, uh, well, I'm a grognard. I go back to the, uh, the 70s and 80s. I think my earliest... Um, well, I, um, uh, my, uh, I, uh, two friends, they were big fantasy readers. Um, uh, and uh, they were my first uh, GMs. Um, Sean O'Prinella and uh, John Phillips. Uh, they um, uh, introduced me to gaming in a, in a light way, but I got into it uh, heavy duty when my brother, who was in the Navy, he pulled 20 years, um, and uh, he came back one tour with a box full of uh, AD&D books. And um, so I was, uh, and he left it with me because he, you know, didn't have a guy to game with anymore. And I sort of like, you know, started reading the books and, and like, you know, playing around with the rules and stuff like that. And then... Um, you know, by the time I was like 13, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm in, uh, you know, um, I'm in like a, a, you know, Tomb of Horrors with, um, uh, you know, with my friend John running it. And um, uh, it is, uh, you know, we're off to the races. And um, most of my early teens was, uh, was AD&D. Um, when I got into my early 20s, second edition came out, and that was the first system that I invested in heavily. And after that, um, my friends and I started um, playing a Marvel Super Heroes role-playing game, the TSR game. Face rip. And that, face rip, absolutely. And that was my first introduction to um, co-GMing and the concept of storytelling. You know, before it was just like, oh, you know, your 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 hero goes off on this adventure, and then they go off on this adventure, and it's just it, it was it was more of an activity, right? And with Marvel, we created our own character, our own. Um, in fact, we called it the continuity, and we basically acted like editors. You know, I mean, we weren't we weren't game masters; we were editors of this comic line, and we were coming up with these storylines, and then we were having our friends create characters and adventure through these stories that we were writing. So um, uh, that, that had good points and bad points. Like it, I, I, I really became a, uh, like a good um, storyteller in part doing that. Um, introducing the idea that an adventure could be more than just busting down a door and like killing goblins. So like, you know, having, What's the overarching theme? What are the, uh, you know, what's the plot? What are the bad guys planning on doing? How are the good guys going to deal with that? So from that point of view, it was good. It took me a while to break the idea of my story. Mm -hmm. And that was, a, that was an important lesson that I had to learn as a game master was it's not my story. You know, the players are, you know, it's their story. They're the heroes, not my folks. So, 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 you know, I, I made a couple of mistakes, and my players thankfully called me on it and say, "Hey, you know, you're, 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 we're just along for the ride in your story." I'm like, "Oh yeah, that is that does kind of suck, doesn't it?" And so that was a lesson. Um, and I think, 
I think one of the reasons why you know old you know old GMs uh, can be you know good GMs is because they've made those mistakes and they've learned from them and and you know especially if you have a good crew and a group of people that you trust. Uh, you spend time together and you have the opportunity to game together. I think, I, I think you really do become better, um, you know, with practice. Well, and, um, more often than not, the first thing you do sucks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and some of my early games, you know, like, you know, the, the, those lessons were hard and painful. Um, but I'm, I'm really fortunate in that. Um, I got two friends, John Phillips, my first GM. I'm still friends with him. We've been uh, friends since second grade. Got another good friend, Jim Mason, who, um, was one of the, those, uh, uh, you know, one of those Marvel players. Um, you know, uh, we've been tight for years and years and, um, uh, and then I've like you know I, I've met friends along the way. Jeremy Forbing is um, uh, is the the rules designer for Mecha versus Kaiju, and um, he's been writing for um, D twenty and Fifth Edition for over ten years now. And um, you know I met him in college, and we've been gaming together for you know probably decades at this point. And so um, I, I've just been really fortunate in the people that I've met, and you know they you know I. They, Especially this iteration, or really, Mecha versus Kaiju itself would not be possible without their help. Mm -hmm. um, uh, friend Mike Todd, he runs a um, uh, a game shop in Lodi called the Launchpad. He was the one that told me about um, True Twenty and their uh, their writing contest. Um, and I uh, I know you know about it, but you know for those who aren't familiar, True Twenty was one of the first. Um, big systems that was built using the d20 system like when that ogl first launched and uh they designed it as a multi-genre system so they wanted to show off the you know their system and what it could do and so they wanted a writing contest to uh demonstrate the different sorts of genres you could play and so i sent in this idea for mecha versus kaiju and um and the the letter i got back was we basically said yes with the title so just, just the idea of that title alone um, uh, uh, sold them on it, um, which uh, which was interesting because the uh, me the name Mecha versus Kaiju was a placeholder that um, you know that I was using uh, until I thought of a quote unquote good name, and then my friend Mike Todd again he said no dummy that is the name that's that tells you everything you need to know about the game so um, uh, so again I, I you know I. I have him to thank for getting started. My friend John Phillips was the one when I was talking about the system. He coined the phrase "kaiju on the DMZ," and that was that became like you know the political angle of the Mecha versus Kaiju world, where you know my basic idea was it's a world where every giant monster movie you've ever seen really happened. And so, you know, as, as uh, uh, I got a history teaching credential, and so I, like, looked at that as a alt history setting. What would the world look like if in, you know, late 40s, early 50s, giant monsters began to appear? What kind of changes would that uh, ring in the world? And, um, uh, and that idea of, like, Kaiju on the DMZ, where you're actually using giant monsters in war, what would that look like? So, um, you know, so I've been really lucky in the people that have been in my life. They've been very uh, inspirational, um, uh, you know, to my work. And, um, and I got to shout out uh, my wife, Christine, who, like, you know, puts up with a ton of this stuff and is, like, one of my play testers as well. So, like, you know, she's been through the trenches as well. Yeah. Now, with that, with that in mind... Uh... Give, I suppose the other I suppose the other half is on this is cov is covering what what your entry to um ka to kaiju was and I'm get I am go mm -hmm. I'm going to guess I'm going to go out on a limb here but give but given the timeline um it was probably a a fair amount of Showa era Godzilla absolutely. In fact, uh, uh, right now I'm sitting here staring at my wall, looking at my um, Showa era Godzilla Criterion collection. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my uh, uh, Shogun Warriors Godzilla on my shelf and stuff. So yeah, absolutely, that was the um, uh, uh, that, that was the starting point. Um, it was um, 
I've actually um, uh, I, I, I've taken to make some videos on TikTok, and I had this little theories, and I'm I'm going to continue doing it, but it's like confessions of a Gen X otaku. And one of the things I talked about was uh, television in the 70s because, I, you know, it's like it is completely different than it is now. So, like, you know, trying to fiddle with rabbit ears to get in the good TV stations because I, I lived in Stockton, California, and um, that's in the Central Valley. It's about an hour and a half away from San Francisco. So it's just at the edge of the good TV stations. Central Valley stations were not really that good, but you got Channel 2, Channel 44 in San Francisco that were amazing. You got Bob Wilkins, Creature Feature, um, uh, along with like um, amazing Japanese cartoons and, um, and live action shows. It's just, they had all the great stuff because it's a San Francisco station. Uh, so, so that was my... Um, that was my real introduction to, um, uh, like, to the monster genre. Um, I also got a shout out to my big brother Randy. Uh, he's nine years older to me, older than me, and so I call him my nerd pusher. So he very carefully cultivated my love of like science fiction. Like you know, when I was young, Lost in Space, and then when I was a little older, Star Trek. He took me to see Star Wars in the theater. Um, you know, bought me my first comic book. So. Um, so, you know, so so he was a great influence on me as well. Um, for television, in the like on the weekends, you would have like these, um, like you know, the weekend movie. And I would, before going outside to play, I would always check the TV guide to see if there were any monster movies. Mm-hmm. You know, so I mean, like if it's like some, um, you know. Uh, I don't know, Chisholm or the Hallelujah Trail or, you know, something like that, I would just forget that. I'm going outside and, you know, going to ride my bike. But, like, if it's a Gamera movie or, or like, you know, or even, like, you know, the old school Universal Frankenstein, um, you know, Wolfman stuff like that, anything like that, like, you know, I ate it up and I would be there in front of the TV instead. Um, I, will note a, I will note a couple things. Even even with even with me being younger, I'm no a lot of that stuff I'm no stranger to because I was because I was raised on the classics. But mm-hmm. um, I will I will note some somebody that one of these days I will I will end up doing a um a a tier a tier maker stream on um got on Godzilla from the original Gojira all the way to all the way to Final Wars um. Mm-hmm. But there is there is one I know that I'm go that I'm going to be dunking on because, uh, because of um, my dis my distaste for it, even when compared to other Showa era movies, and that is Godzilla vs. Megalon, also known as the uh, backdoor man. pilot for Jet Jaguar. Oh yeah, and, and 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 what a shame that 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 they never that they never opened that door. I mean, like you know, that was. Uh, but yeah, but so I think what happened was you know the, the ideas that they had for um, Jet Jaguar went into Zone Fighter. I don't know if you've heard uh, heard of this. Toho had a um, uh, they had a Tokusatsu show in the seventies called Zone Fighter, and it's just like Ultraman or Spectre Man or any of those other sort of like guy in a suit you know, fighting monsters shows. Um, but Zone Fighter was owned by Toho, so you would sometimes get the uh, Godzilla monster showing up. He act- Godzilla himself showed up in that um, uh, in, in, in that show. So um, so that was um, uh, so yeah. So that was definitely something that um, uh, you know that was a part of that '70s vibe, um, and uh, and I mean yeah the 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 bad dubbing and the the recuts and and then like you know just the movies themselves got a little goofy in the late 60s you know trying to capture the kid market um the it I, was i will note there is one other um there's there's one other mainstay of the, of that era that is my whipping boy um and that that unfortunately is mothra um really in in part, in part because I remember, I remember marathoning Mothra's solo movies and kind of getting annoyed that it repeats itself with the whole with the whole Mothra is dying thing. Um, yes, that it's one of those things where you can only use that kind of thing maybe once or twice. But the fact that they ended up using <laughs> it for three movies straight is a bit much. Um, 
I thought I thought th when when um Mothra had it had his, had her appearance in Tokyo SOS and the whole oh you, you need to you need to get rid of the you need, I know that the Kiryu now is is strong enough to that it can hold its own against the Kaiju but you need to get rid of it because Godzilla's bones or so, or something and I, that was that was re that was really stupid and I've never let that go Oh, no, that, that, that's fair. I can I can understand that as a uh, uh, as a plot point. I, I I will say this: the um, uh, the the movie that came before that, um, uh, Godzilla against Mechagodzilla, mm -hmm. uh, that was actually really influential in Mecha versus Kaiju. Uh, and I always recommend if anybody wants to see what a um, a military organization designed to fight giant monsters would look like i think um uh godzilla against mecha godzilla from the early 2000s is a great choice um it, you know it's it, it's unfortunate they didn't like sort of like maintain the um intensity of, of, of that movie and you know like it kind of waned in um in the sequel and i think that's one of the reasons why i really love the hisei era of um of Godzilla movies. Uh, I know Godzilla 85 is technically in the Showa era, but it really is the beginning of the Issei era. And um, the big and, takeaway I remember from it, from the return of Godz from the return of Godzilla, I'm I'm not a fan of the um, dub because it was new because it was New World, and that's a New World is a story for a whole no whole other oh, day. Oh, dude, yeah. But um, <laughs> I have I have I have I have um. In the past, had to wear full plates, and if if any of the stories I've seen are any indication, wearing the Tokusatsu uh, monster suits is far is far more draining. Which is why a lot of the early suit actors, and he, and I'd say even some current ones, had backgrounds in either sumo or baseball. And mm -hmm. the '84 suit was a particular nightmare to the point where they drilled holes in the fingertips so the suit actor wouldn't drown in his own sweat. They never used right. that suit after that. Yeah, it, 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 you definitely are an athlete if you if, if you do that kind of thing. And and you know those guys, um, you know the, uh, 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 those guys are amazing. I've had the have, have had the privilege of meeting some of them uh, in the past, and it, it's it's really being able to. To look at somebody and tell them, you know, you like changed my life. I, that is, you know, that that's like you know, the the best gift I can give to them is is that sort of praise. But um, since you came up on TSR, I'd like to play a bit of a lightning round with you. Oh, okay. Um, I'm gonna get I'm going to give some names that that were TSR games that are not um, D and D, and. I'd like I'd like you to say if it, if it was something you're familiar with, if it was something you played at one point. Um, just first thing that came to mind. Think of it as the nerdiest Rorschach test you've ever taken. <laughs> All right, I'm I'm ready. I hope. Okay, Star Frontiers. Oh yeah. Draw draw sights forever, babe. <laughs> oh, it, it is a free country, and you are free to be wrong. Just kidding. <laughs> um. Top secret. Definitely. In fact, we had um, a, uh, a rather notorious game of um, uh, we were running a, a, a module where we were supposed to infiltrate a um, uh, a yacht uh, that was being held by terrorists, and um, uh, a friend of ours had basically spent the whole his whole character he like tricked out his character to use a shotgun. And I don't know, it's like, like he just was specialized, double specialized, over specialized. It was all about the shotgun. He had this like Spaz 12 and it was like, you know, the first arm. He was just crazy about it. And the first thing the GM has happened is he walks through a door, somebody grabs the shotgun, takes it from him. He never gets it back. And ever since that point, that became like a meme in our group. It's just like every character had their shotgun. It was the thing that they were best at. And, uh, I, I, I don't think he really ever appreciated that uh, that that saying, but we never let him forget it. Well, the dice gods show no mercy. Um, Indeed. Metamorphosis Alpha. 
Oh, you know, I, I was talking about John Phillips. He is a dear lover of Metamorphosis Alpha, and we never played that, but we did play Gamma World First Edition. So, um, uh, you know, so so like the uh, the you know basically the well, what would you call it? Something that like you know the the one that like um, blazes the trail just gets overshadowed by the one the one that comes after it. It's kind of like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, but um, but yeah, we uh, uh, I think I played every single edition of Gamma World, and in fact, I have the. Um, uh, the D20 Gamma World, one like those green boxes with all the cards. I like invested heavily in that system when it came out. So, um, so yeah, I think I, I think I played um, every Gamma World game mm -hmm. there is. And in fact, the the um, the third campaign I'm running because I'm a game master and that's what I do. Um, I play. I run a game every um, every Thursday, and um, I'm using the. Um, uh, I'm using the uh, the Ruins of Pittsburgh uh, module that came in, I think, second or third edition Gamma World. That's my um, uh, that's my um, sandbox for this campaign, and um, basically just like you know re renaming everything, but like just keeping all the city, you know, the, the city descriptors and all the you know the, the the secret organizations and things like that because. You know, when you have a resource like that, you take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. um, Boot Hill. Believe it or not, I did. Yes, I, I um, th during that brief craze in, um, uh, in um, Westerns, you know, late 80s, early 90s, the w Western kind of came back a little bit. Um, I'm pretty sure I made a character that was inspired by um, uh, Clint Eastwood's Pale Rider. I don't think he was a preacher. I think he was like another sort of like doctor or lawyer. He was some kind of other uh, like 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 position. But um, but yeah, he was just basically Clint Eastwood. Because hmm. I guess all the characters are Clint Eastwood and Boot Hill. So you know, it's yeah. nothing original. So I'm not going to bring up Face Rip, Face Rip, because we already covered that. Um, mm -hmm. I am going to bring up either of the either of the two games that use the Saga system. So that'd be Dragonlance oh. Fifth Age and the Marvel Adventure game. Um, is there a Marvel game I didn't play? That's the question. You know, I think was that was that did that come out at the same time Mutants and Masterminds came out? No, this was okay. er, this was ninety five ish. All right, ninety. Oh, you know what? I I was kind of. There was a period of time, um, late '90s. I um, uh, I moved to Seattle. I went to art school. Um, technically, I was going to game design school, and the reason was I had all these crazy stories in mind. And um, I started as a writer, so um, I've been creating stories really since like I was eight, and I saw Star Wars, and it like blew the top of my little eight-year-old mind off. And so I started inventing stories. Um, mostly science fiction stuff. Um, but then in middle school, I had a teacher that said, you know, I was telling these stories to her, and they said, you know what, you should write that down. And I'm like, I should write that down. And I started writing in middle school, and I never stopped. Mm -hmm. So um, so I had all these stories, and so, like, when the 90s are rolling around, and, like, they're actually opening up some schools for game design, I think... Maybe I could like you know be a game maker or something like that. And unfortunately, in the early night or the late nineties, mid nineties, late nineties, um, it was still very much sort of like a graphics based program. They didn't have a lot of coding or anything like that. And I wasn't a visual artist, so um, so nothing ever came of that. But um, but it did get me out of. Stockton for a good long time, and when I came back, I um, I, I was doing some other stuff. But then I got I, I got back into gaming in the early two thousands, heavily when D twenty came out. That was yeah. um, kind of like when I you know when I dove back in. Um, I I've I will maintain that that the Saga system was ahead of its time for you for using cards instead of dice. Mm. Um, a lot of systems do that now, just like regular you know regular deck of playing cards and. Uh, not en not enough, in my opinion, and I know s whenever I bring this up, somebody inevitably brings up Savage Worlds, and I counter with, 
that does not count because that's only using the car that's only using playing cards when it comes to initiative. I'm talking about using cards as the primary resolution system is not done. Right. It. There's very few that um, do it. Well, I remember um, Amber, um, you know, like it was it was called Amber Diceless Role Playing, and uh, and I think they they used a deck of cards, I think, as well. I, I can't remember I can't remember what the mechanics were like. I never I never played that one, but that was the first one I ever heard of that used basically used something other than dice. For uh, for resolution. Are you sure you're not thinking of Everway? Uh, no, well, I mean at Everway. I, I actually haven't heard of Everway, but um, uh, there was a um, game based on the Amber uh, book series, and it used um, uh, it used a deck of cards for its um, uh, resolution. Um, I just I never actually read the system because because that was a series of books I hadn't read, so I kind of mm -hmm. I figured I'd. I felt like a fraud looking at that, <laughs> looking at that role playing game. Um, you know, if uh, uh, if I hadn't read the books it was based on. Yeah. Now, with this new iteration of Mecha versus Kaiju, it's you, you're you're using what you refer to as the fifth engine, and the I think one of the one of the big things that stood out to me that you're doing is you is utilizing multiple di using multiple die types for mm -hmm. the rating. I'm, was that as and especially um in the in the um sample sheet that you showed um was this you trying to carry over the aspect system that was in fate into this particular system aspects are definitely um uh hardwired into anything mecha versus kind of you you, know, you can have my you'll, you'll take my aspects from my cold dead hands um, because it's such a core idea for, um, you know, narratively, for the characters, it gives fuel for the game master, it's like, it's just such a, a, a useful tool, both for making stories, for making characters, um, but as far as the dice go, um, the idea was to sort of um, take the 5e design and add in narrative and storytelling tools from modern gaming and all the tools that we needed were in the the uh, uh the the dmg they had a mod called um ability dice you know uh when you uh or proficiency dice excuse me so um uh one of the mods one of the things they had when they were uh play testing um uh fifth edition was replacing your proficiency bonus with a die and you know there would be like you know so you'd add your strength bonus your skill bonus and then your proficiency die you would roll that in addition to the d20 and it would add a little bit of um a random factor to it um and we we took that idea and just applied it to all of the static bonuses and the idea is that if you are you know, you could you can imagine it like a um, you know, from just a D and D point of view. Like instead of an eighteen strength, you're rolling a D ten. You know, instead. Of, uh, so um, and then if you have um, maybe you're uh, new to the whole job of being a hero, so maybe you only have a D four for your proficiency bonus, and then you have your um, you know maybe. You're just starting out, so you only have a short sword, right? So you're only a D6 for the short sword, and then you roll all that together with a D20, what we call the fortune die, because, you know, fortune and fate and, and, and luck should still have a big part, you know, a big play in what happens. And you roll all those together. Um, you add two of those dice together. And what you, what this adds is the ability to narrate what is helping you in a particular situation. So let's say you roll like a like an 18 on your fortune die. Well, luck was with me here, so like, you know, uh, and and my um, you know, my 5 and my strength um, you know, is not as important as as luck in this situation. But if you roll like a 4 on your d20, um, then it's just like, oh man, I have to rely on my on my wits and my arm and my 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 weapons and then it gives you options for narrating your actions. 
So like, you know, if you, you know, if you roll a four on a fortune die, then your narration ends up being like, you know, I'll tell you, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I'm coming through with my, uh, you know, with my good, strong sword arm and like, you know, my, uh, uh, you know, my brother's dagger or whatever. And, and you can use those to flavor your, um, the, des the descriptions of your actions. Um, so, so that's what I really like about it. It, um, uh, it, it makes the scene more dynamic. And in all of the playtesting that we've done, all the campaigns that I've run with this system, the act of what I call calling out your traits is a role-playing exercise. So um, in, um, in the Mechaverse of Kaiju system, you start with your aspect. So you pick... Uh, uh, you, you pick an aspect like uh, our iconic character, um, Ace Kasaragi. Um, you know, he's a hotshot pilot, and so one of his aspects is um, a master of sky and snark. Mm -hmm. And 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 so that that comes into play whether he is in a uh, you know whether he's in a fighter in a dogfight or whether he's at a bar cracking jokes. So that you know, when you're a really well written aspect can be used in a lot of different situations, and then um, uh, and then the next trait set is your um, uh, is your um, uh, oh my god, it's been a long day, it's been a long day of school. I'm coming, I'm coming here right here. I'm coming, uh, coming up blank. Um, so once you uh, so you have aspects, you have your um, God, I'm sitting here floundering. Uh, give me a second here. Um, hopefully, One. you can edit this out, or you can just let me. Um, uh, you know, you just uh, you know, well, watch me flail. And I, either one of those works. Well, um, so to you get, get your <laughs> to get things to get things back on on the rails before we end up before we end up completely derailing. I will note <laughs> one one major criticism I've had with. Um, with aspect system isn't with the use of aspects themselves, but how in Fate Core they were pre they were presented. Because for all intents and purposes, aspects are a blank check for both mm -hmm. players and for GMs. And my problem, and this is this is something that some Fate games have fixed, like say Chancha, and some haven't, is not providing guidance on where the line is between. A good, you a good aspect and one that might need might need a second look. Um, for a bit of con for a bit of contrast, there's a two page um spread in the core book of Thirteenth Age for its one unique thing, where it yes. kind of goes over um good ideas for one unique thing, questionable ones, and absolutely nots, and why for each mm -hmm. of them. But when you but when you tr when you make the claim of oh an aspect can be anything, um, it's important to accept to establish bound to establish a boundary or get or, um, you or not not just give examples but give good but give good and bad examples so that players and GMs know where the line is. Exactly. Is, yeah. And in fact, our. Yeah, our aspects are um, uh, uh, categorized. So uh, we have um, identity, personality, and drama aspects. And each of those serve a different function. So identity aspect is who you are on the inside. So this would be um, like for, for Ace Kasaragi, that um, you know, uh, uh, you know, master of sky and snark. That's who he is on the inside. Um, what he uh, personality is what you show on the outside. So for Ace, um, his personality aspect is there's a fire inside. And so he shows that sort of energy, that, um, that passion. Um, but on the inside, he's got this unpredictability and this, you know, and this calm coolness uh, from being, you know, like uh, an expert at what, he's, at what he does. Um, so that's sort of the, um, you know, the internal and the external life of the character. And then there are two drama aspects that represent the problems or the challenges in the character's life. So you have two drama aspects, and they are in opposition with one another. 
So, um, for example, Aces is, he's an irrepressible show-off, but at the same time, he's not perfect, but always pushing. So, when you are choosing which aspect you're going to use, um, your identity and your personality dice uh, are a D6, but your drama is a D8. Because if you're going to tap into your drama, then that should, you know, th that should have a stronger effect on the story. And as a game master, when I'm looking at drama, one of the things I have in the GM section is like, you know, what do you do when somebody uses their drama? Um, so like, you know, what I like to do is I like to make a note of it. You know, if, if, if somebody is, um, if somebody is using their irrepressible show off aspect, then as a, as a GM, that's something they want to see more of. And that's, what people are going to see them as. And so, you know, if they later on try and maybe get a little more serious, it might be harder for people to take them, uh, you know, to take them seriously when they do that. Uh, and again, that ties into the whole idea of drama, just a as, as, a, um, as a narrative tool. Um, you know, one, one of the best uses for drama is just getting in people's way. And, you know, ever since the, the days of the Greeks... They were getting in a character's way by their personal choices, and you know, and, and sometimes things coming back and biting them on the butt. So that's the way we frame aspect, and we do it that way to help the the player craft elements of their character. So it isn't just three random elements, you know, three things that you know make up their character, three three or four things. It is very specific parts of their character. And we give suggestions for each, um, uh, uh, for each one of those aspects. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, with that in, with that in mind, um, I do appreciate that you're, that you're using that instead, instead of the, instead of the standard, um, stat set, the standard stat setup. Mm -hmm. And to the, and to that particular end, um, something that something that I am curious about is even even if you're even if you're using um, when you when you're using when you're using archetypes, I'm guessing that in th that in this particular case, that's not ex that's not exactly going to be the equivalent of classes. That, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so archetypes have been a part of uh, Mecha versus Kaiju since um, since the Fate system. Uh, I really wanted, and, and in Fate, the archetypes were the things that did the heavy lifting for making it feel like um, like 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 a manga or anime or giant monster movie uh, system um, with. Uh, with Mecha vs. Kaiju 2020X, it's only it's only part of it. So we've got 17 archetypes, and you're right; they are not as um, they're not as robust as uh, other um, as a full character class. And in part, that's because um, you know so many other portions of the system are. Um, are built so that characters can really customize their uh, their character. Uh, we have a whole chapter on powers, talents, and tools. And the idea of uh, of that is, as a character with XP, you can build yourself a talent, which is like um, uh, one thing that your character can do in a specific situation, and you get a particular bonus for that. Um, a uh, a tool is something that will allow you to do um, something really well, but it could be taken away or could be damaged. Uh, and a power is just an inherent ability that your character has. And each of these are built with perks and drawbacks. Mm -hmm. And we just have a we have a series of like you know mechanical bonuses from perks and mechanical problems from drawbacks, and you just combine those together. And uh, you add those to, you know, to make a, um, uh, a power, which is something that a human being would normally not be able to do. So, like, that could be, like, either the superpower of flight or a jetpack. You know, but, but mechanically, they work basically the same. Um, 
talents would be um, your character class abilities. So, you know, being able to attack multiple targets at the same time, that could be a talent. Uh, uh, or tools, which would be like your magic items or your high-tech pieces of equipment. Mm-hmm. So all of that is you're, you're able to customize. So the anime archetypes, they don't actually have to do as much heavy lifting. So um, every archetype has um, uh, a name taken from, a name and description taken from uh, anime culture. And um, one of the things that is truly remarkable is that there have always been archetypes in anime and manga and monster movies and things like that. And they've always been recognizable. Like, if you ever, if you ever watched, um, let's see, a lot of people watch Robotech. You could see, like, oh, he's the big guy. Yeah. You know, he's the Joker. You know, mm-hmm. and, and these are classic archetypical characters. But in anime, um, they have literally hundreds of archetypes. Yeah. And some of them are under, like, very broad categories. And they will, like shave those down very fine at times. Um, so um, we, in creating this new system, one of the things that um, we set out to do was to make a system that truly allows you to emulate the action and drama of anime, manga, and giant monster movies. So uh, we've got 17 archetypes, which is about um, uh, you know, half again more than we had in the old system. Uh, they've all been reworked. Um, they're all um, steeped in, uh, in in anime culture, and I, I really was careful to you know pick archetypes that would represent a broad spectrum of characters, um, both sort of traditionally um, traditionally like you know positive and troubled characters. So you get things like the Yusha, the hero. And uh, and then you also get things like the Bakchan, which is um, a character that grew up in a family that would do things that are like not so savory. Like the tri- the, the classes is like you know the, the son of the yakuza uh, uh, boss. You know that would be you know that would be sort of a, a, a classic version of that character. Um, so so each of these archetypes represent you know represents a clear kind of character. They have a, a description that is um, inspired by you know a lot of the classic storylines. So when you're reading the description, you can you can see um, hints to a lot of different um, uh, different anime series. Uh, then every um, every archetype has a guiding value. Um, values are the things that a character holds dear. Uh, so this would be um, uh, one of the trait sets is uh, is values. So, uh, for example, um, uh, which is more important to your to this character? Is it composure or passion? Is it kinship or self reliance? Is it ferocity or spirituality? Those two start at uh, a d6, and then a character can decide to increase one of those by decreasing the other. So you could have like a um, uh, uh, you know you could have a, a, a passion of D8, but um, you would have a composure of D4. Um, the archetype gives you a guiding value that you boost without reducing the other. So that's kind of if you're unsure about what your character would do in a particular situation, you could look to your guiding value, and that could be something that um, you uh, you think is um, you know is important. Um, we talked about aspects, the identity aspect. There's a lot of words that, um, uh, there's suggested words for that particular kind of, um, of character. Like, for example, I mentioned the Bakchan. The, um, suggested keywords for them would be dishonorable, illicit, scandalous, vicious, um, where, like, you know, the, um, the Baka, the fool, he would have words like clumsy, thoughtless, wacky. Um, and, and and so that's those are words that sort of suggest what kind of aspect mm-hmm. uh, you might create for that particular archetype. Yeah. And again, that sort of lends itself to uh, you know uh, to controlling the more you know outlandish sorts of aspects you might you might show up. Um, mm-hmm. And then every one of them has a uh, uh, has a talent that they uh, that they're good at. Basically, represent uh, representing. 
um, you know, why they're good at that particular thing. So, um, you know, so the Bachan has a talent born to power. Um, they can intimidate people very well because they come from a family that intimidates people as a living. So, uh, so each of the archetypes has like, you know, a, uh, something that they're good at, um, to sort of represent, uh, their character. Um, so, so, so yeah, um, the, uh, the, the, the archetypes are not classes, but they are fully developed personality. Yeah. And then, uh, players can use that as a starting point, um, if their character story takes them away from that, they are able to, to, to switch over to a different archetype. Um, and the, um, the consequences for that would be more story-related than mechanical. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it would require them to like, do things like, um, you know, their guiding value would reduce. And, you know, and, and, and if, um, you know, if that brought, you know, if, if that change was like, you know, um, uh, harmful or, or like maybe like well not harmful but let's say um, uh, less than ideal from a mechanical point of view uh, that's, that would just be like you know kind of part of the fun of uh, uh, of making that change mm -hmm. now with for a game called Mecha versus Kaiju I feel it's um, worth no worth noting that what constitutes Mecha can take Many, many forms. And this is one of the things I keep hammering on people whenever they say that they want to do a mecha-based campaign or run, or that I sh or recommend them a mech RPG. Mm -hmm. you, can, on, you can have, on one hand, the jumped-up power armor that you see in, say, Gundam or a lot of the, a lot of the super robot entries from the 1970s. Mm -hmm. On the other end, you can have the tanks with legs that you see in, say, Votoms, Battletech, and Heavy Gear, where they're they're Absolutely. not meant to be all, they're not meant to be all that mobile because they're being controlled the same way a tank would be controlled, complete with um, having a turret twist in the in the form of torso twisting. Right. And it's it. It is important to na to nail down where on that spectrum some somebody is regarding their particular mecha. Um, in the case of mecha versus kaiju, where do, where does the titular mecha fall into that category? Well, the beauty of it is you can um, uh, you can create any um, you know, you know, any setting that you want. Uh, uh, MBK is a uh, is a toolbox, so. Uh, the rules for creating a mecha are basically it is just another trade set, just like your, um, you know, just like your uh, your uh, your values, just like your style, um, which is the uh, which is the other standard character trait set, um, kind of like how you do things. Um, mecha traits are uh, mecha traits represent the abilities of the mecha. So you've got. Um, You've got auxiliary, which is just like anything non-combat related. You've got power, which is um, energy and speed. Uh, superstructure, which is strength and endurance. And weapons, which is how well you hurt things. And that's it. So if you're because it's it it because it it uh, breaks down the mecha into basically just a set of traits uh, that you can attach um, uh, that you can attach systems to. You can craft anything you want. And uh, uh, I'll give you an example. We've got um, my baseline campaign is a military sci-fi setting, uh, squad-based combat, uh, basically where like a group of ace pilots uh, has their own customized mecha, and they are uh, they're the Mecha Assault Force. They are the premier defenders of Japan against the giant robots. And that's the um, that's sort of the vanilla setting. Uh, but there are... Um, uh, we've got a uh, another setting called um, uh, Shen, uh, Shen Battler Aurora, which is inspired by the Isekai genre, where humans from Earth travel to a fantasy world, and because they... Why am I thinking of Gunbine? 
All of that were done by it is absolutely my, uh, uh, my, my main inspiration for that. Yes. Uh, so, so, um, so yeah, you, uh, in that case, it's, they're basically big magical suits of armor. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in, um, uh, I have a, um, uh, I have a, a, a great guy who, uh, has been playing, uh, MBK for years in India, and he just ran a campaign where the Mecca were actually, um, uh, like effects of Hindu gods, and they, but they were all built using the same, uh, the same rule set, you know, because even if you're, you know, even if you're magic or if you're technology or if you're like, you know, powered by a god, it's like, well, you know, that, that, that like mobile thing can only hold so much power, can only do so much damage, and can only take so much stress before it uh before it breaks mm -hmm. so all so, so the, the rules are set up so that you can create any um any sort of uh mecha you can imagine and because the power system is modular you can build any weapon any system that you want to add to uh that you want to add to it mm -hmm. i may i may i may um I may pitch th pitch this in more detail later, but there's two demi settings when it comes when it comes to Mecca that have been created as part as part of my podcast. Um, both of them stemming from just exploring an idea. One of them was a was a project that I nicknamed Combined Arms Mecca. This idea of u of utilizing a Mecca setting where they're where they're not the be all end all in in combat situations, but are part of a, but are part of a larger whole, the way the way um the way ta the way tanks tend to be. Um, mm -hmm. So it's it's not just me it's not just mecha fighting other mecha, but mecha fighting uh, alongside t alongside tanks, alongside air support, all, all of that stuff. Um, and we ended up we ended up creating a setup where each where all the big theme was. Um, a, a mech pilot was referred to as a swordsman because all of the mechs were named after different types of swords, each of them filling different types of roles. Um, the the most bog standard is the it, is the Spatha, which is a refit of the original prototype, which we called the Gladius. Um, and then there's some that are built around a, around assault, some that are built around a recon, some that are built around bombarding like these Vihander, which is base which is a nice way of saying <laughs> you guys are talking some mad shit for some really solid looking grid coordinates <laughs> so yeah yeah i was like you know we, you know let, let's end in the thing that hits you know that hits the hardest because the the big point of inspiration to doing that kind of design was when i looked at oddly enough um the core mecha in gundam wing because each of the each of the original Gundams in that series were very clearly built around a specific theater of combat, and I've talked about this in the past. Heavy right. arms, I felt was I felt was built around urban combat. You know, n nice sight lines and choke points where he can just sit his happy ass down and pull and um, provide suppressing fire. And if he had to shoot through a building, well, he could. Yeah. Um. Uh, Wing, um, air, I would say, air. I would say air, air cavalry, air cav, air cavalry, and um, bunker busting. Yeah, yeah, um. yeah. Absolutely, and and uh, I the um, I actually in in the fate um uh, cycle of uh, of books, I had a a supplement called um the. Uh, uh, Mecha Assault Force Technical Manual, and then I detailed uh, went into detail about some of the other vehicles uh, that you know that had been coming to play over the history of the Mecha Assault Force. The MAF actually grew out of this group called the Anti Kaiju Force, which was the first or military organization in the 1950s that basically was like um, it was basically a bunch of military guys getting together, going, "What the hell are we going to do to fight these things?" And so they had crazy ideas, like they had like you know armed dirigibles and and stuff like that. Um, so so it gave me a chance to really play with some very fun ideas uh, that were not 
always practical, but, you know, kind of the stuff that people were just trying to, like, you know, throw it up against the wall, see if it sticks. Yeah. Um, and then it, uh, and then I also got to play with the genres of, um, of anime uh, and, and robots in anime. So um, uh, the giant remote controlled robot controlled by a teenager that's in there mataro gianto uh there's this character um in in the game called um uh professor rampo chiari and the story and, and his story is that when he was a child and you might remember this from the original godzilla movie mm-hmm. i was inspired by the scene where the mother is holding her children she's you know like you know she's crying but she's saying it's okay we're gonna be with your father soon um and uh, I was inspired by that, and I'm like, you know, uh, in in this world, that scene happens, but the child has this vision, and for just a moment, his mind touches uh, the um, uh, the unified field theory. Mm-hmm. Like for just a moment, he can see how all energy patterns merge, and the, and he just has this basically reli- scientific religious experience that opens his mind to just insane technology. And so, like, in the 1960s, when, like, monsters are roaming and the, and, and the anti-kaiju force can't stop it, he shows up with a giant remote-controlled robot that he tells it to do with his watch. And, like, this kid is controlling this giant robot, and nobody, you know, and everyone's like, okay, he's going to fight the giant monsters. Um, so, uh, so that introduces, like, you know, the giant robo kind of style, the... Um, um, Tetsujin 13, that sort of thing. Uh, 1970s was all about super robots, so I've got like a Raydeen inspired, you know, or, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, Mazinger style uh, giant robot. Um, you know what's one of the, the big 1980s... lies about some um, about giant about Mecha in in um so, in so many parts of, parts of the anime community. What's that? This i there there's seen this idea that me- that mechs were a d- were up until uh, between Mazinger and Mobile Suit Gundam were a glorified toy commercial. That is not <laughs> the case. That may have been the case very early on, but it didn't last. No, they were a glorified music commercial. Because <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there definitely was um, uh, uh, was a lot of that. Um, I, I will admit, however, you know, um, growing up as a kid in the 1970s and seeing the Shogun Warriors and thinking, oh man, I want, I want that. And then realizing what a small, tiny percentage of the Japanese toys that were actually out there. Um, it was, uh, you know, seeing, seeing just a few of the pictures of the stuff that didn't make it in. Oh man, that, that was, that was torture. For a kid my age, I'm I'm certain I'm certain it was. Um, I will note since you you mentioned something done by like a while back, we did approach the idea of um, building a set, building a Magitech themed mecha setting where the mechs were built around elements that mm. loosely loosely decided to lean into into um into into um Wusha to the point where the um. The elements in the I Ching served it served as our basis for the types. Um, nice. My, my favorite of them is the is the met, our um, metal types because they because we had we had it we had it in universe that the that um metal type me- mechs and their pilots are often referred to as zombie mechs. Not because oh not because they look like zombies or anything like that, but just because they are very, very, very shit at dying. <laughs> um, they're not the the only way the only way you can really take them out is to is to kill the pilot because if you blow if you blow an arm off, you blow a leg off, they will find a way to just keep to just keep coming. Oh, nice! It doesn't, it doesn't exactly help that they're built. They're built. They're built as. What we refer to as defensive frontline. They're meant to take hits, and they can, they can take a lot of them. Like you, you... well, you know, it, it's great that you have like you know you're you're drawing on so many different aspects mm-hmm. of of life, not just anime and manga. Um, you know, for uh, I, I mentioned before that um, you know my setting is a. Um, 
uh, my setting is a uh, an alt history world where you know the the sort of guiding principle is every giant monster movie that ever happened that, that it was ever made really happened in this world. Mm-hmm. So you know there was um, you know there was a Godzilla analog in the 1950s and a Mothra and all of those and 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 all of those kinds of creatures uh, in the 1950s in America giant insects ravage across the um uh the uh, uh the pacific southwest uh so to the point where they'd actually have they have to evacuate a huge part of the united states because it's just inundated with giant bugs um so uh, uh so when i looked at this world and i'm imagining you know uh, i i i kind of look at it like okay so america gets really messed up by giant insects what stops russia from basically becoming the only superpower and um it's it's kind of hardwired into the system um the uh the kaiju were created um through through, the first kaiju were created by a weird circumstance um you know a mutation and the first kaiju is created because of the atomic bomb in hiroshima uh so that causes the uh, the creation of the first kaiju. It is killed by the second atomic bomb in Nagasaki, and the genetic material. Um, uh, America says, "Okay, it's, we're going to collect all this stuff, and we're going to make sure that it's you know destroyed and, and, and never happens again." Well, spies from North Korea grab some of this genetic material, take it over, uh, take it back, um, uh, you know, to their country, and over the next few years, grow giant monsters and they unleash them on during the korean war and then they lose control of them and then they start attacking other countries Mm -hmm. and so um you know because the the the, quote unquote the commies uh, are responsible for the giant monsters uh that that whole philosophy has basically lost its political cachet so like you know nobody wants to be a commie United States is all messed up. There's all these monsters everywhere. So, so what does Europe do? They pull out of all of their um, their colonies, and they just set up Fortress Europa and they they defend themselves. So it's this domino effect of you know of like kind of following the events. Like, okay, what would happen then? So, like um, South America gets its act together from a defensive point of view and is actually able to like you know. Uh, uh, South America in like you know the 60s and 70s was a horror show, and in this world it's like well no they actually are able to defend themselves because they have to. Africa is able to uh, decolonize far earlier, and I used language maps of um, uh, of different African languages to set up the borders of this new African nation, and so. Everything that I've done for oh, and Australia is just like filled with like you know crazy Australians who like are terrassing through the outback and giant robots fighting monsters. So I mean that's like your if, if you want a Mad Max setting or something like that, go to Australia. It's just like tons of uh, kaiju beating fun. So um, so all of these things are kind of inspired by like well, what would happen then? What would happen then? And so the world I've created, it, I hope is one that makes sense that is logical within sort of the you know the the you know the 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 premise that is you know that's set up in it Mm -hmm. now with that with that in mind um when it comes to when it comes to the 2020x um version of it what would you be shooting for as far as the total page count well, the, um, the 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 straight rules, um, a streamlined ver- version will probably be 150 pages. Uh, we, you know, I, I, you know, I I could easily release a a robust 250 page version with, um, uh, you know, like the 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 like. The, the an idea of like you know having a full like you know a starter adventure campaign I had that in the um, in the original fate book so I want to have something like that but a really uh, good um, GM section so like you know how do you how do you run this game and how do you run 
um, giant monster games, giant robot games, some of the specific things about that genre that 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 show up. Um, uh, you know the uh, you know the dial that I can turn as far as page count could be things like you know how many monsters do I want to put in, how many robots do I want to, uh, do I want to put in. Um, it's really a question of um, what's going to be most helpful to the uh, to the players and the game masters while also at the same time making it affordable for the players and the game masters. Um, and that, and that, that's some of the things that we're talking about right now um, on our Patreon. Uh, I launched the Patreon a year ago, and uh, that's been, um, uh, that has just been a phenomenal thing. It's an amazing community, and I've, I've met people all over the world. Um, uh, the, you know, the, the, the quality of the playtesting I'm getting through the Patreon is just through the roof. These are amazing people. Um, I've got, um, uh, the, the, the basic tier is $3, so you can just get, like, once a month you get a rules update. All of the new rules and everything gets added in. Um, you know, you can just get a, like, you know, a new version of the game every month. Um, $5 level, the pilots, they contribute to, um, the uh, the monthly project they give suggestions and I give weekly updates and um, and, and new things. The um, uh, what we're working on right now is um, uh, I put out a poll and they want to see uh, they want to see robots. So uh, uh, you know this month it's all about the robots. So like Matara Gianto, the remote controlled robot I told you about, mm -hmm. Kagutsuchi, the the super robot. We're gonna get all of those in the early versions of the Tetsujin uh, uh, Mecha. Uh, so we're gonna uh, gonna get versions of all of those out for our um, for, for our patrons at the five dollar level, and at the ten dollar level, those are my aces. And I have a campaign that I've been running for a year, and these people are amazing. I have folks that are like game designers themselves, people who are you know I got lawyers on on this thing. So like the rules, they get into the nitty gritty of the rules, and I know whether something is working or not when they, you know, with, with them on the crew. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and we, it's, it's just been a, um, you know, you know, that's been a, uh, a, a really, um, a really helpful thing in decide, in figuring out what do people want? And I can talk to them directly. Like, you know, so like, I you know, put out a poll, what do you want to see uh, more of? And, you know, um, it was, it was a close tie between, uh, robots and the GM section. So I'm going to be adding a little to the GM section as well, but I'll probably go in deep in October and uh, put it together, uh, like, uh, uh, you know, add in everything kind of that I have put together as a game master over the past year. Um, uh, starter adventure, uh, campaign, and then ideas for, you know, like how to do, di you know, different kinds of campaigns, like the Magitech system or um, like, like, like a more mill sci-fi situation like Votums or something like that. Um, as far as, uh, you know, si size of the book, um, part of that's going to depend on, um, uh, you know, on, on, on funding. Um, I could, I could make a really big book if I wanted to, just a question of like, you know, what, you know, uh, uh, you know, what, what people are going to want. Mm -hmm. And I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops since, it's very clear from ta from talking with you that this isn't a case of just trying to put a square peg in a round hole regarding 5e, but doing its own particular thing. Um, so yeah, the, the the goal has always been, you know, with, with this new system was to like, you know, fate was fate is a, is a, is a very functional system, but it never felt like something that you could really, um, it never really felt like an anime or manga system. And so, you know, with, with this new one, I really wanted it to, to, to feel that way. And we, we sweated blood over the, uh, the trait sets and all of that. It was, uh, you know, d just figuring out what traits you're going to, you know, you're going to use it would make it feel like an anime series. Um, you know, that took us, you know, a couple of weeks just to put together that part. Oh. So, but with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around yeah. here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. 
<laughs> well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I, I, I thank everybody who's you know uh, who's been listening to me blather. And um, uh, if, if you want to find out more, you can go to mechaversuskaiju.com. And if you want to uh, you know check out the um, uh, if you want to check out the system, uh, my Patreon has a um, uh, a seven day trial that you can just kind of like try on the system, see if you like it. That's at patreon.com slash mecha versus kaiju. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. Nicky Moss!